I'm Duke Nukem, and I'm coming to get the rest of you alien He was a mainstay of video game culture through the 1990s, and arguably being one of the most iconic characters the medium has ever produced. However, the man known as Duke Nukem has been noticeably absent from the gaming landscape, which is largely because of the simple fact that Duke Nukem killed his own franchise. Warping to a dark matter field. Try and lay low until- You're not going anywhere. Running is for When you think of Duke Nukem today, you probably conjure a mental image of a blonde, muscle-bound action hero wisecracking his way through a landscape of aliens, monsters, and anthropomorphic pigment. Glorious mother of sh Got enough ordnance in here to bring religion to the alien hordes. However correct this image might be, it's only half the story. Duke Nukem's true battlefield lies behind the scenes, as one man attempted through pure force of will to propel a fictional character out of the landscape of beloved mascot and into the realm of mythic legend. The only problem is that this quest, like many great tales, ends in heartbreak. But this story, like any good fable, has a humble beginning. Duke Nukem first appeared in the Apogee software platformer from 1991. This three episode adventure is a far cry from what the character would later become. The simple graphics, standard good versus evil plot were still enough to engender the goodwill of players though. The game proved popular. However, if you didn't know what he'd become, you would never guess that the character you're looking at would pull in over a billion dollars over the next two decades. Duke Nukem 2, released in 1993, centers on an evil alien empire kidnapping Duke Nukem during an Oprah Winfrey show appearance and taking them to their homeworld in order to reverse engineer an invasion plan based on his knowledge of his homeworld. Obviously, he breaks free, starts killing aliens, and has a grand old time. With improved graphics, smoother gameplay, and loads more personality, Duke Nukem 2 pushed every aspect that its predecessor established. And here's where we get the first big divergence of the franchise, the ultimate risk that took things in a bold new direction. While the previous two games were platformers, the genre was empirically lessening in mainstream appeal. And so the controversial decision was made to shift Duke Nukem into being a first person shooter. Today, this seems like an obvious move. Duke is practically the face of the 90s incarnation of the genre. But at the time, it was a rough call to make. The entrenched dogma was that FPS games shouldn't have protagonists. They shouldn't have any personality, let alone a flamboyant one. It's time to abort your whole friggin' species. But thanks to Doom and Wolfenstein 3D, the rising tide of FPS players were obviously there for more games to be aimed at. So the decision was made they would create the ultimate first person shooter and they would distinguish themselves from the competition by leaning into Duke Nukem's outrageous personality. The game is set on Earth sometime in the early 21st century. We follow Duke as he attempts to repel an invading alien force. The game moves through a variety of locations, a space station, a moon base, and even a flooded city. Many of Duke's irreverent lines are drawn from popular films and television programs. Quips inspired by Jaws, Evil Dead, and They Live abound. It's time to kick and chew bubble gum. And I'm all out of gum. The violence and sardonic tone of the game could either be seen as a deconstruction and lampooning of the toxic and misogynistic tendencies of similar characters in media, or just another entry into those damaging archetypes. Your mileage may vary. Duke Nukem 3D was a smash success, selling over 3.5 million copies. It also received widespread critical acclaim, with many saying that it had pushed the FPS genre to previously thought unattainable heights. But much like any art form, the inevitable question was soon asked, what's next? America is counting on you. America, yeah. Success only begets the desire for more success, you see. Unfortunately, despite the want and ambition to best Duke Nukem 3D, the next Duke Nukem game would be mired in political infighting, creative struggles, and a development hell that would last close to 15 years. 3D Realms co-founder George Brizard announced a sequel titled Duke Nukem Forever on April 27, 1997, which was expected to be released by Christmas of the following year. However, that would not be the case. Initial work for the game was constructed using id Software's Quake 2 engine, and trailer footage premiered at E3 in May of 1998. While the footage of combat on a moving truck went over well with critics, members of the internal team have since said that Brizard, who was leading the project, 
became obsessed with one-upping Duke Nukem 3, and the only way he could see to do that was to constantly incorporate new features and playstyles from other games. He wanted the game to be cutting edge when it was released. However, by constantly chasing what was fashionable at the time, he caused the devs to have to constantly start over, meaning that the game never made any serious headway or progress. To make things worse, weeks after the May 1998 E3 footage premiered, Brozard made the decision to have the game switch to the Unreal Engine. This necessitated a complete ground up rebuild of the project. In 1999, they switched again to an even newer version of Unreal Engine. By the year 2000, the game was lost in a morass of its own ambition. Due to a massive influx of cash, thanks to the resounding success of Duke Nukem 3D, 3D Realms did not need outside investment or assistance. Thus, they had no one they were beholden to. Brizard was in full control of the situation, and his one and only desire was to work at whatever pace he wanted. In December of 2000, Take-Two Interactive purchased the rights to publish the game. Many thought that this was the turning point at which the game would finally be finished. They were wrong. Despite premiering another trailer at E3 in the summer of 2001, which was met with positive responses, Broussard would spend the next five years going down creative blind alleys, backing out and starting again. Teams of developers and programmers quit, were rehired and replaced as the turnover on the game became an industry-wide joke. In 2007, 3D Realms hired Raphael Van Lyra as a new creative director. He was impressed by the game's ambition and playstyle. He felt that he could finish it within a year. However, George Broussard stepped in and politically maneuvered in order to make this not happen. And eventually, after 3D Realms went back to take two and asked for $6 million, but still couldn't reach an agreement on terms for the project, they ran out of money. A decade of development time isn't enough, apparently. Finally, in May of 2010, Gearbox Software stepped in to take over the project. And thankfully, they actually did it. They completed Duke Nukem Forever, which released May 3rd, 2011. So was it worth it? Did the game that took 15 years, give or take, finally take the world by storm? Frankly, no. The game's humor was criticized, the gameplay was thought to be clunky, and the feel of the game was in punch for being exactly what it was. A game from another era. Every artistic medium has their lost masterpieces. Their man who killed Don Quixote's, and their Jodorowsky's dunes. But in video games, those masterpieces have a much higher percentage of completion and release to lackluster response. Duke Nukem Forever collapsed under the weight of its own ambition, which is difficult to reconcile because the Duke Nukem franchise has never been about anything other than quippy jokes. Rano was stroking one hell of a murder, man. I'd make a joke, but I don't even know where I am. Female objectification and machine gun fire. What pushed George Brizard into thinking that Duke Nukem was a totemic icon of artistic achievement? Why did he think that the first person shooter was the ultimate expression of his ego? We'll never know. What we do know for sure is that Duke Nukem forever killed the Duke Nukem we all wanted to believe in. The mythic, larger than life character that could have sustained a franchise akin to Mario and Master Chief. Duke Nukem forever was proof that the world will move on without you. The real battle that every artist has to fight is how to stay relevant and incorporate it into the times they're living in. And George Brizard thought the world would wait for Duke Nukem, but we didn't. And it proved one thing undeniably, Duke Nukem is not forever. Hail to the king, baby. And that's it for this episode of Nerdstalgic Gaming. What do you think? Will Duke Nukem ever regain his prominence in the gaming world? Maybe a Doom 2016 reboot is in store for him? Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. And as always, like, comment, and subscribe for more videos just like this.